When I was growing up, we didn't have all these hashkochas that we have now. And um, so what we would have to do is sort of read the ingredient panel and that's, you know, in, in sort of take I would, it, I would, <laughs> that would be very difficult. Right, but, but, but people don't realize that there are lots of components in, in an ingredient and in a formula that might not be listed, that might not be kosher in the flavors or... or, or that's not even on the package. Right. Over a million products in this world on kosher food have that OU stamp. You've probably seen on Reddit people asking, what in the world is that? What exactly makes something kosher? What's the process behind it? And who's the person managing all of that? Rabbi Menachem Ginak of the OU is a Rav, is a friend of one of the former presidents and a massive Talmud of the Rav. And I got to sit down with him to talk about everything food in this week's episode. So you will know a lot more about kosher. This episode is in memory of Shimon David Ben Yaakov Shleima, as well as Miriam Sarah Bas Yaakov Moshe. And we are embarking on maybe one of the most important challenges that our community is facing today, Shadokim. So stick around in the middle of the episode. So you're going to hear an incredible uh, movement that's happening that you could be a part of, that I want you to be a part of. If you're a listener, please be a part of it. Now, here is my conversation with Ravi Ganak. I'm Yaakov Langer, and you're listening to Inspiration for the Nation. Okay, today I have the pleasure of sitting down with Ravi Ganak, the, I don't know if I'm getting this right, the CEO of the OU's Kashas Division. Correct. So I always, like many people, when I heard OU, I was thinking, okay, that's the, the stamp of approval that's uh, making sure that what I'm eating is not tray for non-kosher, but the OU is, is a lot bigger than just the Kashas Division. Right, there are many, many programs. Um, it's the most, uh, I, I'd say the most known is NCSY, National Council Synagogue Youth, mm -hmm. which is, is primarily to care of kids in public schools and it, in other venues as well. Um, it also has a very extensive program called Yachad, which are for kids with uh, disabilities, autism, um, and it's as an example and uh it's also politically involved we have an office in washington we also do a lot in that both in terms of kiev and uh programs in terms of soldiers um so there's a we, lot and, there's and a lot of extensive programs. from what i understand the the cautious division funds i don't know if everything but a lot of everything else that's correct in other words, the money that comes in from Kasha, which is not insubstantial, is, so to speak, reinvested in the Jewish community through all these multifarious programs. Was that the plan from the start to, to have it set up with that model? Yes. So you started- I mean, in a, it, it, the Initially, you know, Kasha is independently significant to make sure that there's kosher food available to the, you know, through the breadth of the United States. And uh, the first supervisions were, at, you know, something was Heinz in Pittsburgh in 1924, the exact date, we're not 100% sure. But as a, as a division and as a program, that started with Rabbi Alexander Rosenberg in, um, I think, 1952. Wow. I, I'm a, a child of someone who grew up with, of course, there's like the OU, whatever it is, but... For, at least for people listening that are younger, or um, they they as well don't know that world. But people that are a little older than me, they grew up with a world where you know I remember people saying like chewing gum. It didn't have a hex like it was like a normal thing to not right. have a hechsha on things. And that's correct. And when I, when I was growing up as well, in other words, it wasn't as uh, widespread as it is now. Um, the, the OU gives supervision to something in the range of 12 and a half thousand manufacturing facilities in over 100 countries wow so also, and you oversee all of that i mean I've, you know we have significant staff right yeah, right, right responsible for that Hold is that so so how did when did you start in 1980 1980 guys okay, so you're doing this for a long time um well the first question is did you anticipate that it the cautious department would become as big as it is right now? Like you're probably pulling in hundreds of millions of dollars from, from all of the 
I see the OU on everything, even non-foods. I see OU, you know, stamp. Well, it's not quite hundreds of million, but it's a significant number, and so it's not. But it's um, uh, so when I first came, you know, the, it, it's it's grown exponentially. You know, we had, you know, it, just in terms of, for example, income, it's it's grown by at least a factor of over fifty. Wow. And part of it is also because the the world economy changed as the global economy grew. And American companies look for sources of supply, either because of price or quality or availability around for manufacturing facilities and product around the world. So we became much more global. So uh, there's a lot about the OU that I do want to talk about, but there's also a lot of other things that you uh, um, that are part of your life. But before we, we leave the OU conversation, I have a few things I want to talk about. So there's hot topics. I, I spoke to your, your son before this. I'm friendly with him. Great, great guy. Indeed. And, and uh, I want to go through some topics with you. Not that I know much about them, but you definitely know much about them. And I'm, I'm just curious, like, what the process is to, you know, make a judgment on whether something's kosher or not kosher or will have the OU approval. So something recently um, that I remember hearing about is this impossible pork a product where it's not really pork it's it's it tastes like it but it's plant-based or whatever based um and from my understanding uh, you and the ou decided not to uh give a hechsher for that could you take us through that process right. so at least initially uh you know positions that we're not going to give a hechsher impossible burger itself um you know impossible foods when possible burgers are very popular a product, a very excellent product, which is completely plant-based, you know, tastes, tastes like a burger. My mother made steak and one of those uh, the other night, and I liked, maybe maybe my mother's just a great cook, I liked the Impossible Burger better. And very, I would never in a million years, and people are going to kill, my friends are going to kill me for saying that, but that particular night. Uh, yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, so it. so it is, it's, it's a wonderful product, and... Uh, so, and the relationship with them is an important one and a very good one. But it, this one was, was primarily, you know, it's so to speak a, you know, sensitivity or marketing decision. Because mm -hmm. if I, for example, when I go into a shul, I take a poll, you know, do you think we should give supervision on something that tastes like pork, it's called pork and so on. So it's a divide, half say yes and half say no. So in terms of the halakhic consideration, there isn't much, namely that the, the issue of marasayin, if if it's, if for example, if you eat it and it's clear you have that says on it impossible pork and you put it on the table, so then that's okay. Like it says in Shulchan Aruch, that if a person is cooking meat with almond milk, so he should just put almonds on the table. Right. And so that wouldn't, that's not marasayin. So that, that could be obviated. But, the, uh, you know, pork and pig has a, you know, a, a, a lot of people react very strongly and negatively. Part of it is the history related to uh, to pig. We know about, um, you know, people when we, you know, poor, when we persecuted, forced to eat pig, forced to eat pork. We know the story during the Chobin that they, um, um, you know, when they ran out of Carbonos, the Romans, you know, sent, sent, pig and a pig is the symbol of Rome mm -hmm. and as I'll say you know part of the reason is because Rome on the outside it was a very uh, developed and sophisticated civilization but inside it was completely brutal and, and corrupt so it's like metaphoric like the pig that shows it's has a fish uh, you know it has split hooves but doesn't chew its cud so internally it's it's not kosher at all, but externally it might sort of right. try to mold itself. So for whatever the psychological or historical reasons behind it, people have a very strong, even though the lava of, of Chaza is the same as the lava of Nevela, but as it relates to that, it's a very strong reaction. It's interesting, it's not only amongst, in, in the Jewish community, but even amongst Muslims, halal, they also have a very strong feeling and the, the halal supervising agencies or authorities said that they would not give supervision to this. So, um, so, uh, as I say, it's, there's sort of a, you know, divide of opinion about it. And you I also thought, probably get people saying like, 
listen, I just want to know if I'm eating kosher or not kosher. Right. And that's not an unreasonable position. So as right. I said, when I take this bowl, which I spoke in a shul recently between Milch and Mariv, it was literally 50-50. I'd say a little bit more that we shouldn't give the supervision. So not. Right. right. So, but again, that's a matter of emotion and, and, and sensitivity, and we, and we want to relate to that. You mentioned halal. It's interesting. My wife actually in college was, she had to work on a report, so she was helping an, a halal app um, and I, I guess she learned, I guess, the, the halachas of it. And she was very, she was like, whoa, this is so similar to us. Do you find yourself in position? Again, I don't know how halal officially works, but like they probably also have their forms of heksher. Do you find yourself like talking to halal, people like running halal heksherim? On, on occasion, there's a man uh, who has a very extensive one. I remember he was interviewed, what, this, his name is Muhammad Shaldri. And uh, he was interviewed and they asked him, you know, did you take a, a page out of the OU book? <laughs> and he says, no, I took the entire book. <laughs> <laughs> wow. right. So uh, there, there, are, there are certain similarities. That's so interesting. But not just that, in general, in terms of, uh, you know, between Islam and Judaism, in terms of certain, um, you know, practices. Yeah, so I, I went to... Rabbi Ken Spiro, Spiro, I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right, in Aisha Torah, he's a historian, which gets a very bad rap because you say historian, people are like, hey, this is going to be boring, at least my generation. And um, he's he's fascinating. And he goes through like how in the Torah, how Yishmael and Yitzchak, it kind of just mimics what's going on now. Like that's just a, <clears> like a, a setting for, you know, a mice of a similar Lebanon. And he, he, he has a whole class on going through how every everything that we have um in judaism um the muslims have have it but it's like it's a little more extreme so like we have yom kippur for one day they have ramadan for 30 days we have um you know i don't know he goes through all like halachas it's it's, it's very interesting so i guess with kashras it's it's there's right. similarities but they they can't drink alcohol though so right one of the basic rules is that they can't have alcohol so if something is you know, has a, is, has a halal supervision, it will not have alcohol. So up until the past- you should, In general, you know, one of the markets that we speak about, uh, people who are, you know, Muslims who care about halal, and they when they don't have uh, their own supervision available, generally speaking, they will rely on the OU. Really? And also in terms of meat, because kosher slaughtered meat is, at least by the evidence, if they don't have halal slaughtered, is, is acceptable. Is, does it go the other way for us or no? Absolutely not. No, okay. I'm like, look, I'm like, okay, I'll look for the halal hacksha. Um, So up until the passing of Rabbi Belsky, it was, there was, I guess, three people paskening. It was, it was uh, you, uh, Rabbi Belsky, Elav Shalom, and, and Rav Shachter. Uh, what was that process like? So, um, of course, we, we lost Rabbi, Rabbi Belsky. Um, who I, I had imagined you had a very close relationship to. I did. To. I, did I spoke at his Levaya. I had a very close relationship. And I, I, I was once sort of, obviously, who solicited him to come to the OU. And he brought with him, you know, huge, aside from credibility, but he, he was quite amazing in terms of his knowledge on, on the technical level. You know, we would all just sit in amazement. First of all, his, he had a, a, a very mathematical mind, so he could calculate, you know, in terms of shishim or what, what's the, the volume of the, of, the, of the container, but even of the walls of the container, you know, to figure out if the shishim or not, just, just like that. And he, you know, for art school, he was their advisor at all about astronomical issues that come up in the Gemara. So he had a, a very strong scientific and, and technical orientation. As a matter of fact, one, I think I mentioned this at five, there was once a plant manager who said that when he was speaking to him, he thought he was speaking to a colleague because he was so, hmm. you know, in terms of the actual technology, so 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 involved. And so, you know, um, when I came to the, that's one of the things I wanted to do was have an actual set you know, different post game or different abonim who Cause, c who we could use and speak to. Because like the when a lot of the programs you mentioned, I would I don't like putting labels on things, but sometimes it's just easier. Like it's I would consider it very modern orthodox, but when you think when I think of OU Kashras, it's something that is accepted by almost everyone, which like the 
I guess Rabbi Belsky's from that like very like uh, Shivish. I don't know how to Litvish world that if he was there, then all of a sudden, right? Like, well, and, uh, when I first came to the OU, I mean, I, I, I at this point actually I hired everybody who's there at the OU because I'm there so long. Right. I mean, I'm talking to the Kasher department, and uh, when I came, there were only one and a half people working there. You know, <laughs> now the, you know, we have probably about a hundred people working in the Kasher department. And just in our office in in uh, New York, but uh, w when I hired, I I wanted it to look like the the Orthodox Jewish community, namely that when it's not just YU, it's not just Chaim Berlin, but we have really from from every uh, category. And recently, we I hired uh, Benjamin Aryeh Glick, mm -hmm. who is from Satmar, who used to be one of the people who ran the his actors, the Sam Hashkar CRC very well connected to the Ada, who we have very, very good relationship with Rabbi Pappenheim. So you'll see from every yeshiva, whether it's, you know, from Lakewood, Chaim Berlin, Tor Vadas, um, you know, we're sort of across, across all the so-called divides. Right, very inclusive, because now right. a lot of people could uh, So that benefit. also helps in terms just, on the, so to speak, the marketing, just the credibility. These are, you know, Speaks people know everybody there, and many, many of the people working there. I'd say almost all. So I see, you know, serious tamid That's incredible. So how how would you how do you pass in a shiloh with? I guess now it's you and a shaft. Like how do you? What's well, the process? We, we, like? Well, we consult with other people also. I should mention that uh, um, Rosh Weiss is also one of the people we turn to, and also somebody who we might not know the name of Mordechai Gross, who was a very big expert on shchita amongst mm -hmm. other things. He's uh, has a Besden and a following. He lives in Bnei Brak. Did I meant the the, the dynamic and person that was trying? He was an Eloy and brilliant. And that Tama Chacham and Belsky passed away. Where did you feel maybe a little lost? You're like, what are we going to do now? I, 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 there was a, a lacuna there. There's no question about it. And the wonderful thing about Belsky, he would come a, a, when he came every week. He came with his Talmidim from Torah Vadas. Mm. So they would sit in to hear the Shaila. So there'd be about five of them. And uh, we're about to move this this actually right now, this week. But we have a, a portrait of Fred Belksy right outside my office. Mm. Very nice. He, he, had a, he also, you know, aside from, you know, the knowledge, just as a human being, you didn't know him, but he was, uh, he was such a, you know, very, very principled. Um, he could really take a very strong stand and with and even controversial issues. He wasn't always right, but he was always very highly principled and motivated. That's incredible. So I want to shift to your political um, side, which I find very interesting, maybe because I you know, grew up in Flatbush and like a very Litvish background, the average home and person and rub, I would, I would imagine, again, I don't know, because like everyone keeps politics out, but they're like very Republican. And um, I don't know much about politics, but I do know you have uh, a long relationship with the Clintons. Yes. So could you tell us about how that came about? And I mean, there's a, a few things that you've even done with the Clintons. Right. Well, <clears throat> My my relationship with Bill Clinton wasn't president at the time yet. He was a candidate. He was then governor of Arkansas. Was I was at an event and I was the one who introduced him. And uh, in my comments, I spoke about um, at the time. I think it was George Bush the first. Um, he, he was criticized for lack of vision, and he used to complain about oh, it's the vision thing again. Hmm. So I cited the pasuk in Michele, where there is no vision, I'd say that vision is an essential ingredient of leadership, as the scriptures tells us, where there is no vision, the people perish. Below chazan v'yifah ha'am, a pasuk in Michele. And he liked it and he said, you know, I think I'm gonna use that in my acceptance speech at the convention. Hmm. So initially I thought he was sort of joshing me, but if you go back and listen to his um, speech at the convention, that was sort of the rhetorical pivot for his speech, and he kept coming back to that. And then when he and Al Gore started, you know, their campaign together on a, on a bus, that was the banner, where there is no vision, the people perish. And uh, so that's how we started the relationship. And then the, the amazing thing about Bill Clinton is that he's, first of all, I'm, I'm sure you know he's really, really smart. 
I'd, I'd imagine. But you, yeah, but I don't know. You could say that like every person is really smart, but no, yeah. no, that's it, it, absolutely. You can say that. That's not true. <laughs> right, right. But but he's really extremely smart. He was, you know, a Rhodes Scholar. But whenever I quote a book to him, he'd already read it, um, and he's very also familiar with the Bible. Mm -hmm. So if you quote a pasuk to him, he'll know it. Interesting. And, and, and I, I did, as you know. So afterwards, we began a, a correspondence about, you know, about the Bible, or you know, with, about themes or things that might be of interest or inspiration to him in terms of his difficult times during the uh, impeachment, the, the Lewinsky story, th during and uh, in, in terms of leadership. Um, both you know biblical and historical models and uh, he we would correspond about it and then in person or um well i, I used to go to the white house pretty often he'd invite me but I, this was a, a written correspondence and then like he, letters letters and he for said those, for those listening who who are very young don't letters are like an email but on a paper <laughs> i say yeah we have a young audience so right. i want to make sure they understand what that so, is so and then he decided you know he suggested why, why don't we publish them and then published it as a book. He wrote the introduction. Um, Jonathan Sachs, I think he wrote the four. Jonathan Sachs wrote the introduction. And I would sort of get other people to write. Um, um, you know, Robert Lamb, Jonathan Sachs, uh, Ivan Salvechik. I mean, there were, there were some Nobel Prize winners as well. But it was, I would sort of, you know, get other people to write as well. And, um, and we, we continued this well past this presidency, and we're talking now about starting it up again. What, meaning starting what up again? This correspondence, because I used to do it about every every week, every other week, and uh, sort of paused. And uh, so, was that does that mean like you gave a drush on Shabbos, and you're like, oh, I think Bill would appreciate this idea? Um, well, it, it wasn't quite the drush on Shabbos, right? Um, but it was, uh, you know. Could you know could, that could be <laughs> source material? But it was you know things that I thought were relevant to him, also about Israel. Um, wow. We'll be right back to this week's episode, but first, we've all heard about it, we've all talked about it, and we've all come to our own brilliant conclusions about why it exists, or even if it does exist. Now, did you notice that everyone you speak to seems to have a different opinion about the cause of the challenges in our shidduch system? Did you notice that everyone seems so convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that their theory is clearly the correct one? Is it because of the age gap, the boys being too picky, the girls saying no too quickly, maybe we don't have enough shachanim, or maybe the girls are way more yeshivish than the boys, or the boys are way less educated than the girls, etc. So many opinions. Are they all right? Are some of them right? Is it a combination of all of them? Maybe. Maybe not. One thing is for sure clear. The proper solution clearly will depend on its cause, and it will be very hard for Klal Yisrael as a community to figure out an effective solution if there's no clear consensus regarding its cause. This is where the amazing team at the Shidduch Institute comes in. Yes, the Shidduch Institute. The Shidduch Institute has worked for close to a year with a team of the best data scientists to develop a customized survey for the community the survey will help to pinpoint exactly what the main issues are for singles today in the Shidduch world. They are hoping to collect information from as many families as possible and use that information to fuel their mission. Once the survey has been completed, the next step is to share the data with the appropriate askanim and pour every resource into what comes up as the most pressing causes of the problems plaguing the Shidduch system today. Are you ready to be part of the solution? You can. Go to shidduchinstitute.com and fill out the survey today. And better yet, send the link to your friends and family and have them fill out the survey too. This is a problem, a challenge that our community is facing and you could be part of the help. They're not asking you for your donations, for your money. They're just asking you for a few minutes of your time. If you're an Orthodox Jew or you're a Jew, just go ahead and fill out this easy form. You could see a link in the show notes. They're great. And we really want to solve this problem, but we need the proper data. And I am blessed to be a part of this mission. So go ahead and help help the singles of the world. So fill it out. Now back to this week's episode. What is that? I mean, I don't know what it's like, and I'm sure most people don't know what it's like. What's it like to be 
I guess, buddies with the president of the United States. Um, like Barack Obama, I, this is, I, again, I'm not into politics. I, I don't even know what side I am, but Barack Obama follows me on Twitter. I don't know why, but that's my sheikhs. Oh, look at that. That's interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting. Wow. I don't know why, but, so, but you uh, are like really actually friends. With yeah, Bill Clinton. we're pretty good friends. I went with him several times to Israel as part of his delegation, you know, for the signing of the uh, Israeli Jordanian peace treaty. Um, and we trained both with him and with Hillary. Wow. And on occasion, I try to be helpful when writing a speech here and there. Really? That's so interesting. Does he ever help out with like, okay, you know, you're, you're about to give your kahila, uh, you know, a speech or something. You're like, oh, maybe Bill could, uh, or the, oh, it's only one way, like you helping him. No, but he's helped us in many other ways. Um, I'll give you just one example. The uh, Square Rebbe approached me, who he had four sidim who were, who were incarcerated. And um, yes, if, with, you know, long terms. And I spoke, he asked me to speak to see if it was possible to get a clemency or pardon. So I spoke to the president about it. He agreed to meet with the square rabbi. I decided not to go to that meeting, but it was meeting the Oval Office with Izzy Spitzer. Why did you decide not to go? Well, whatever the reasons. Okay. I, thought, I thought it was better for the, the rabbi right. to make the, you know, I spoke mm -hmm. to the president independently. And then um, last day in office, he, he, uh, Pardon. Upon all four. Wow. One of them actually was, I mean, not that I know that the, the, the case so deeply, but um, Julie Berman's law firm, Keshola, one of the, one of the uh, partners w was a former U.S. attorney, and he, and he knew about the case, and he said one of those people was actually completely innocent. And they, and they got a very severe sentence, and, it's, and anyhow, so. Wow, that's, that's incredible. But like, just not just Bill Clinton. You're you, you've been involved in the political side of whether it's uh, Senator Joe Lieberman, which I'm sure you're more than just friends with him. Yeah, well, Joe Lieberman and I are very close friends. We learn together every week. Really, every, every Friday for many many years. Well, what did you what did you learn with Joe Lieberman? Well, we started learning Maseches Brachas, and now we usually speak about the Pasha. You, you know, speak about the Pasha for about five minutes, and the rest of the time we're about politics. Wow. <laughs> and uh, we've published some of his books. So, because um, one of the things I do at the OU is also I started a sort of string like a publishing house, OU Press, mm -hmm. and we put Svarim and books. So we've we've published um, many things from the Rav of Soloveitchik, both in Halacha and Sechtis, and also um, we're about to publish some more books based on manuscripts that we have, and uh, you know that's something that's very important to me. So people listening, I, I always think they love stories and you have a lot of connections or experiences with G'daylim. Um, I have a list here. Obviously, like you just mentioned, the Rav, um, Rav Cutler, Rav Shmuel Kamenetsky, Rav Elia Ber Wachvogel, um, Rav Nata Greenbaut, who just passed away. Could you could you share, it's a kind of an open-ended question, but could you share maybe a story with one of them, some of them that you've experienced that that shows how great they were or how you appreciated them? I'll tell you one of the people I'm exceptionally close to and maintain very close relations with their family and with the children. Um, I'd say two people. One was with Michael Feinstein. He was Biskorov's son-in-law, brought Haskama to my Sefer. And the other was with Moshe Shmuel Shapira, Rashiv and Beryakov, mm -hmm. both Briskers, so they're on the right derech. <laughs> um, they're, they're cousins. Um, and um, in, uh, just the thing that a wife fell in love with Moshe Shmuel, first of all, his swarm are wonderful, and he's a, you know, he was the lamdan of the door. But he was also the, just the nicest person. And, um, and uh, you know, and he, I remember when I, I, I met him because I was, one summer I spent, um, I took my family, we were in uh, Hanov, and then his yeshiva moved from Ber Yaakov to Hano for a while. Um, it was in the Gros Shul. And, you know, he would speak Shalash Shuras, but he would also sing. And, you know, this notion, for me, it was, you know, a, a real Briska London. He was, you know, first cousin Briskarov. And, you know, his, he was a Menagin. And he's saying, you just saw the wonderful heart together with, you know, 
the incisive, incisive mind, and then we became very, very close. Whenever I go to Tetzal, I usually say he, his, his his grandson Arye has a, a wonderful yeshiva, also with his son Naftali Tzvi and Naftali. And I usually go get when I'm there in Tetzal, I say a shir there, and I became very, always very close to my Shmuel. Really nice. I, and so that, that's those qualities that I find so unusual. You know, this Briskalamdan, but with you know singing those two, you know they. That's not what you would have usually put together. And Remichel, I got to know Remichel. My father passed away, and this was in 1968. They went to Israel to see the Kever, and I was staying by my uncle, Nochem Ginachowski. And um, I went, to, that's the first time I met Remichel. It was that. And the Vav always had a very high opinion of Remichel. They're, they're cousins twice over. Mm. Um, he, they're cousins because he's, his wife is Biskor's daughter, so that makes him first cousin. And also he's a Feinstein, the Rav is a Feinstein, because his mother, Rebelli Pirshin was a Feinstein, and his mother uh, was a first cousin to Ramesha Feinstein, and therefore also, so the Rav is a, a, a cousin also to Good Yechas. Good Yechas. It's Good Yechas, yeah. right. So, um, and so um, I remember once I came back from it, so on the Rav asked, Numit Vemen Hot the Land, and you know, I'm not going to give you the list, but it was a pretty extensive list of different Rashivs and that's all. And I mentioned Remichel. Ah, Remichel, I can say Allah best to learn Remichel can learn better than all of them. Hmm. So he had a very high opinion of Remichel. And when the Rav, I'm just, I should mention him, not the Greenblatt, who just, after this, I'm going to the Shiva, and his Levi was just the other day in Fest Yishalayim. He was a Talmud of of, uh, of Remichel. And because uh, Remichel w- w- was, he actually bought Nevin Nutter to Boston. When the Rav in 1940 <coughs> had a koilu in Boston, and uh, it's called Hechel Reb Chaim. And when his his father, with much Salvechik, passed away, and he took over his stella at YU, and you took a so um, the coil closed down, but Remichel was, was there like with the Rav in Boston, and then he went to Tver Shishlaim, and Reb Nutter went both, he was with him in Tver Shishlaim, and was also with Remichel in, um, in Boston. Mm-hmm. So uh, actually he wrote in one of the Masson magazines, so there's a magazine that, a journal, toe journal that we put out from the OU, it has two parts to it, one is, um, then different sugyas, and then issues and kashas, halachic issues and kashas. So he wrote, it was, I think, that I just went to reference it the other day because it not, it was he in, in Yud Zayin, that was the Chavez, he wrote a, just an exceptional hesped about the Rav. But he was very, very close to Rav Michal. And I remember once, I, that just shows also a little bit about Rav Michal's breath. Um, Reb Nissen Alpert mm-hmm. was one of the Rashif in YU, but he was one of R- R- Moshe's closest Talmudim. Yeah, he died very young. He died, unfortunately, very young from lung cancer. I actually took him to Boston once to try to get, there's an experimental treatment for lung, you know, for lung cancer, but it was very advanced and it was very experimental. Uh, the doctor's name was Dr. Osban. He was the Rav's doctor. He became very friendly. He's actually a Vom Osban from Riverdale, hmm. is uh, their cousins somehow. Um, and uh, I took Vinicent to, you know, for that program. And Vinicent also had a wonderful sense of humor. I remember when we were there, I had, uh, I was giving, whether it was white, white, white blood cells or something for him, and you know, they're taking out, and the, the needle, and me, you know, I was just completely pale. Hmm. And I remember he looked at me and says, I'm not sure who's giving blood to who, <laughs> but that was missing. So, and I took him to visit the Rav. This when the Rav was already had stopped coming into YU when he was he was older, but he had a high regard for for him. And um, I remember when I first became head of the OU. So Nissen Alpert, this speaks about the two people, told me, you know, there's somebody who works for you who will be working, who is Rav Moshe's best talmud. And he said, that's Reb Nutter Greenblatt. A few years ago, Reb Nutter was in my office. I never had told him the story. I told him this story. Hmm. He says, of course, you know it's not true. That Reb Nissen was Reb Moshe. <laughs> so, so maybe it's Eshel Kaim Shneim. But uh, right. they were both exceptional people. 
Wow. Of integrity, of brilliance, you know, real character, cared about other people. That's really, special people. That's really, really beautiful. Okay, so before I get to the ending questions that I have, one other point I want to bring up um, that you don't really find this so often. Um, you are very into Abraham Lincoln. I did my research. That's true. You're a big fan. So what? what's, I mean, obviously, I know the very basics of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, why, why are you so into Abraham Lincoln? Abraham Lincoln represents the very best of the United States. Of course, he did a lot to transform the United States. And he, to me, he always, he always had a certain Jewish quality to him. First of all, he was, you know, just in terms of his personal history, he, he, he grew up with no education, basically no education, 11 months of, you know, in what was called the Blab School. He had a very difficult relationship with his father, but he wrote the greatest prose in American history. The second, you know, the get, most famous Gettysburg Address, and then the second inaugural. And he was a man of such wisdom and principle, we can all learn from Abraham Lincoln. And uh, I've written many articles about Abraham Lincoln. I have in my house, I have some letters of his and a and a brief, three-page brief that he wrote, the legal brief. And like an actual letter. Xavier Kutcher. Wow. That is right. What would you, if you could sit down with Abraham Lincoln for 30 minutes, what would you discuss with him? Oh, I, you know, I don't know. I just, just, they once asked me this in the view. Who, if you could, two people you could, you know, who would you want to meet? So I had, you know, so what, what was I going to say, you know, people for Tanakh? So I, I said, uh, Chaim and uh, Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Together or? <laughs> yeah, <they> were, <laughs> that's very interesting. Um, there's, I, I like asking people this question. It's a hard question to answer, but there's 613 mitzvahs. Is there a mitzvah in particular that you... Uh, feel a little more shaykhist to, a little more connection to than the others? It, it shifts. I understand it shifts for people. But for right now, what's, what's your... Well, mitzvah? I think for all of us, we always think when we think, of, you know, the primary one is Tama Torah. Mm. Tama Torah connected Kulam. That's uh, what defines us. It's, it's what, you know, the study of Torah is what makes the Jewish people unique. You know, it's interesting. I was just talking to a friend of mine um, recently got married and he was saying like, you know, he's like, it's honestly harder for me to learn now because I'm married and obviously have these other responsibilities that he's happy to have that. And it's kind of interesting. Like, I feel like the people who fall in love with Tyra and learning it, they very often get like, you know, Rabbi Belsky, you know, like people asking him a million Shilas, which I get it's, it's, it's a form of learning, but like he's, I'm sure Rabbi Belsky just wanted to sit there and learn. The Rav just wanted to sit there and just learn. And Hashem puts these, like, I guess, I don't know, obstacles in, in the way of uh, learning. It's, it's like a very interesting thing with Talmud Torah. Well, you know, uh, you, you know, you mentioned a person like that, Rabbi, Rabbi Grimm, of course, he's so much on my mind now because he just passed away in his midst of his shiva. But he had an incredible schedule. He would leave in the mo Monday morning and come back uh, Thursday night. And he was really doing chesed all the time, which means he would go, he, he, he was very similar to Rabbi Belson. He, he knew what the Rav used to call the realia. He knew how to do shchit, he knew how to do niku, he knew how to, you know, one of the things I pointed him to do when I came to the OU at a certain stage was to coordinate and handle all the shritas under the OU. But he knew all of those things and he knew how to, and amongst them was to be Masada Gittin and he was very active in that. And, and, uh, he would sometimes, at his own, you know, at his own cost, travel to some forlorn place or some forlorn woman to to help her out, and you know, cajole her husband to give a get. And it was this is just who he was. Um, Rabbi Elephant, who works at the OU, told me that Rabbi, Rabbi Grimblet had told him the story that there was a woman in Chile who wanted to be Megaya. And he went, he flew down, you know, there was a Besnay, he was going to arrange everything. And then she was sort of, a, she, she, not hesitant, but she was, she, he saw that she was a little bit depressed. He asked, you know, why, you know, he asked her about this frame of mind. He said, because she came from a very religious Catholic family background, and they were very disappointed with her. And uh, because of her decision, you know, to convert, 
and um, and she, you know, she was sort of annoyed with her and upset and angry at her. And so she said, you know, but she still wants to go through with it. So she says, you know what, let's not do it. I'm not going to do it now. I want you to, if you're going to be Megaya, you have to do it with Simcha, with mm-hmm. joy. And if, you know, let's come, let's, I want you to think about it more, get into a more positive, uh, you know, feeling. And indeed, she, you know, she called she, when, I'm not sure how long, you know, the period was, but she said, no, she's very insistent about it. She wants to, she's looking forward to it and so on. And he came back and he had his own course. This is Rabbi uh, Greenblatt, and he was Megayah. Wow. Yeah. It's, uh, I always feel sad hearing like these gems about people that, you know, after they pass away, just the nature of it. I'm sure a lot of people obviously knew how special he was, mm-hmm. but I always get sad. I'm like, oh man, and like we just lost him. It's very hard. Um, I want to swing back to uh, the OU just a little. Um, what's something about Kashris that you find people mix up or make a mistake on often? Um. Well, you know, I, I'm not sure that they make a mistake, but there's, when I was growing up, you know, as, as I said, you know, the, oh, we didn't have all these hashkochas that we have now. And, um, and you know, we, 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 so what do we have to do is sort of read the ingredient panel and that's, you know, in, in sort of- I would, I would, <laughs> that would be very difficult. Right, but, but, but people don't realize that there are lots of components in, in an ingredient and in a formula that might not be listed, that might not be kosher in the flavors or-, or, or That's not even on the package. Right, or it might be, for example, oils that people don't realize. And nowadays, it's, it's actually become less of a problem, but used to be, you know, they had, and they still have, animal, vegetable plants. Now they're making oil, animal and, and, and maybe tallow and vegetable oil, maybe sometimes at the same equipment. So there could be issues, even if it's, it's a, you know, regular vegetable oil, but made, made on non-kosher equipment. So and I think people don't, didn't, at least then and even now, they don't always realize that. Um, yeah, I hear that. That's a easy mistake to make. Okay, so I'm gonna finish off with the last question of, what's the worst advice you have ever received in your life? The worst advice. I don't know. I can't. You don't have something. One incident to remember. I'm sure there's plenty of times. <laughs> plenty of mistakes I made. That's for sure. But bad advice I gave. What's the the best advice you've ever received? Um. Well, the best decision I made, and which was the most important decision, was who I married. So. Hmm. That's nice. Is is she going to be listening to this? Now she will. <laughs> <laughs> well. Ravi Ganak, thank you very much for coming in. Um, I hope, you know, during this time, I mean, before you were on like 17 phone calls, so I hope the world did not, uh, or like the extra world did not burn down while I took your time now. But I think you have a good team that's uh, doing a good job. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. Go ahead, please go ahead and fill out that Shidduch uh, survey. It is easy it's simple and it's helpful we're trying to get a few thousand more people to fill it out so go ahead and share this episode with someone that you think would enjoy my conversation with Robbie Kanak and also someone who could and should fill out the survey I mean probably so many people in your your phone maybe share it on your status I, I don't think I've ever asked you to share anything on your status go ahead and check out our phone line for people that don't have the internet or have a lot of filters on their computer. You could listen to our show by calling in. It's very easy to hear. Check out our other podcasts on the Living the Chaim Network. Go ahead and rate us five stars and go ahead and give $72 to a tzedakah that you love. I don't know. Why not? Thank you so much for listening to this episode. You can be inspirational. L'chaim. Living L'chaim.